Father God in heaven, our gracious heavenly King, Lord, we want to hear from you. But before, Lord, we open up your word, we heard the sirens just a moment ago. Uh, someone in this, in this town needs help, so I pray that your angels will be flying ahead even of the emergency vehicles and be there, Lord, uh, to help. Lord, now at this moment, we want to hear you. We want to hear your voice. So may the words spoken come from the very throne of grace into our hearts to change us, that we may be more like you, that we may follow, that we may shine. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I was on cloud nine. I was, I was barely touching the ground that day. I was just so excited, smiling from ear to ear. I was on top of the world. What brought me to this state of joy, you ask? Well, I was working my summer job that year. This was years ago when I was working at Adventureland, working in the games department. And I was working at Bottle Bash where you throw a bean bag and you try to knock the bottles over. Working there was certainly not my reason of joy that day. I was sweating in the Iowa summer heat, but I didn't care. Because you see, in just a few hours from that moment, just a few hours, I would get off work and I would go to the Bondurant Carnival. Now, you must be thinking the Bondurant Carnival must be really cool and exciting or else Pastor Michael just loves carnivals. Actually, neither is true. It wasn't all that exciting and I'm not that thrilled with carnivals. But it wasn't the carnival that had me trembling with excitement on that late evening. See, what had happened was a few moments before, a girl named Jill, who was a co-worker of mine, stopped to chat with me. And Jill had been sent as an emissary. She had come to me with a message. She told me that Jeanette was asking if I wanted to go to the carnival with her after work. That was just a couple years ago in that picture there. So Jill asks me on behalf of Jeanette if I will go to the carnival with Jeanette. And so I calmly replied to Jill, sure, that'd be cool. But inside I was like, yes, all right. That summer Jeanette and I started dating as teenagers. And we had a blast that summer. But the more we hung out, the more differences we discovered. And we ended up having some conflict from time to time. <laughs> some disagreements came to us. And then it ended. It ended. Oh, come on. You, know, you guys heartless this morning? Come on. It all ended, it all came crashing down, our summer love, when one of us broke up with the other one. I'll keep that quiet as to who broke up with who, because even though my wife is not here today, she's back in Iowa, this is being recorded. <laughs> and there's no reason for me to get in trouble later today. But don't get too sad, because the story actually does have a happy ending, I can assure you. But we will keep the details of that breakup under wraps. But in the end, we just could not see how the two of us could get along long term. Turns out we needed a second look at each other. Well, last week we started a sermon series taking a second look into the Old Testament. And we looked at a familiar story, the story of Jonah. And we got a second look at grace. And we found grace in the Old Testament. Amen? It's there. Today, let's again look at this familiar story. Let's look at Jonah's story, and maybe, just maybe, we'll find a second look at mission in the Old Testament too. You see, mission in the Bible, it's God's calling to mission, and it's crystal clear when you get to the New Testament. At the very end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus, as He's getting ready to leave, He says what to His followers? Make disciples of all nations. Crystal clear, that call to mission. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says, you shall be witnesses to me. Where? 
to the end of the earth. The mission call in the New Testament is go to all the world. But what about the Old Testament? Does God believe in mission to the world in the Old Testament, or is it just in the New where we find that? Well, many people have read the Old Testament stories, and they've concluded that before Jesus came, God was only interested in Jewish people. Is that true? Did God care about mission before Jesus came? Did God care about the whole world, or did the Lord only care about one select group of people? Well, my friends, I believe that we will find the call to mission, the same call to mission that we find in the New Testament is also in the book of Jonah. Because the message of Jonah is quite simply, God's grace goes to all people. That's the mission in Jonah. God's call to mission means that His people will share the message of grace everywhere they go, and when necessary, even use words. Now, that sounds good. You say, Pastor, that sounds good that the mission is the same in the Old and New Testament, but is it really true? Can we really find that in the Old Testament? Well, it may be hard at first look, and we may miss it if we focus on things like whales swallowing people or the destruction of cities or God separating people from each other. We need a closer look. We need a second look in the Bible. So open your Bibles with me. We're going to start not quite yet in Jonah. We will get there, but we're going to start in Genesis. What is the mission in the Old Testament? Genesis chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 1. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Open the Bibles or sit next to someone who's got a Bible open or find your phone. Find a Bible in there. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. The beginning of mission here, God says, get out of your country, and that seems like God is separating. But why is He doing this? When you look at verse 3, it says, I will bless those who bless you, I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's the end goal. God's rescue plan of grace starts with calling Abraham out. But the end goal is to bless everyone on the planet. And we see this as we go further on in the Old Testament. If you turn to Isaiah chapter 19, follow me there. Isaiah chapter 19, verse Isaiah 19, verse 25, God is speaking here, and listen to these strange words that we may not have caught the first time. The Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Here in the Old Testament, where we would expect to see Egypt as an enemy, Assyria, who was an enemy, God says, He's connected to Egypt, Assyria, and Israel. See, in the Old Testament, God separated Israel and poured out His love, His mercy, and His instruction on them. Why? So that when the other nations saw the blessings of Israel, they might learn about their true Creator God. And friends, Jonah is a prime example in the Old Testament of God's calling to mission. Have you ever wondered why the Bible got organized like it did? how the books got ordered this way or that way. It's not chronological if you read through it. So why did they get put this way? Well, Jonah has its particular spot in the Bible. You probably can't see it, but it's right there. It has a particular spot there for a reason, because the books right before it, Joel, Amos, and Obadiah, they all speak about God's judgment against the nations against the Gentiles. So because of that fact, on the heels of those inspired statements of judgment, God quickly brings in the message of Jonah to bring balance, to reveal that God cares about all nations and all peoples, even if His followers do not. So the story of Jonah, let's turn there right now. 
And let's take another look in this book. So turn to Jonah in your Bible. It's very easy to find. It's right after Obadiah. So turn to Obadiah. Turn one more page. You'll find Jonah. It's also right in front of Micah, too. So if you find Micah, you're, you're real close. About two-thirds of the way through your Bible, you'll find it. And Jonah. In this story, we find the prophet Jonah, and he's called prophet. So we know right off the bat that this, the main character is a believer in God. He's a follower. He's already accepted God's call to ministry. He's already a prophet. But the problem comes in verse 1. So Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. The problem is that Jonah is called to go outside his territory. He's called out of his comfort zone. Nineveh is the enemy of, of Israel. They're, they're pagans. They're a city full of sinners. And I have to go there, Jonah thought. So Jonah says, forget this. And he goes the opposite way from where God called him to. Jonah deemed that the Ninevites were not worth his preaching, and they were not worth God's grace. But what about us? Who are our Ninevites? Who are the people that we think are not worth it, that we would look at the far city of Nineveh and say, uh-uh, they don't deserve? Now, folks, we rarely go so far as to say that someone is not worthy of grace. But can we treat people? Can we look at people in such a way as to wish that they would not be here with us at church? Who are our Ninevites? Are they people who look different than we do? Are they people who worship different, differently than we do? I know a story of a pastor one time was working on his sermon in a coffee house, and he was going up to get a drink, and he had all his theological books with him. Standing right behind him was a guy all dressed in black, spiky hair, tattoos, piercings all over the place. And the pastor was thinking, oh, my. Sure enough, this guy enters into a conversation with him. He sees all the theological books. He says, oh, to the pastor, the guy behind him. Oh, he also was wearing a Marilyn Manson T-shirt. So Marilyn Manson t-shirt guy says to the pastor, oh, you must be one of those religious types, huh? So the pastor real quickly says, no, I'm not. In fact, I hate religious people. Guy was taken aback. He said, yeah, I do. And, and in fact, Jesus did too. Jesus had all sorts of problems with religious people. He didn't get along with them at all. But you wouldn't be interested in that. The guy goes, what? Jesus didn't like religious people? What are you talking about? He said, yeah, Jesus had all sorts of conflict with religious people. They used to argue with him constantly, but you wouldn't be interested. He said, no, no, tell me more. He's got Marilyn Manson t-shirt guy asking to tell him about Jesus. Amen. <laughs> what if people look different than we do? What if they don't dress like us? What if they've got ink on their skin or scars on their skin? What if they're pierced up? Or what if it's not how they look? What if they think differently than we do? What if their theology is different than us? Have we made Ninevites of anyone in our lives? Our classmates, our co-workers, maybe the person right across the street. Friends, we have to learn. We have to learn that God is mighty to save, not just us, but everybody. And the story of Jonah reveals that God's mission drives him to exert his sovereign power to save sinful people. But the story starts off, Jonah gets called, and Jonah runs from God. He says, I'm not doing this. And it's amazing because God says, okay, I can work with this. So we pick up the story in Jonah chapter 1, verse 16, after Jonah has gotten on a boat to sail away. From God's calling. The storm comes. The sailors say, we're in trouble here. What are we going to do? And they find out it's Jonah's fault. So Jonah says, pick me up and throw me 
into the water. They said, we can't do that. He says, you got to. So they do. They toss him into the water. And the sea calms down. And Jonah chapter 1, verse 16 says, The men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. God uses Jonah's disobedience to reveal himself to pagan sailors because God cares about the lost. Now we fast forward the story to Jonah chapter 3, verse 5. Jonah finally, after a little fishing excursion, decides that I will follow God now. And he goes to Nineveh and he preaches. Jonah 3 verse 5 says, Though the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. They repent of their evil. And God does not destroy the city. But their salvation is a source of despair for Jonah. He should have been on cloud nine, right? Has there ever been a more successful evangelistic campaign than in Nineveh? The whole town from the greatest to the least turns, and Jonah prays, but not a prayer of thanksgiving. Chapter 4, verse 3, he says, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Wow. He prays for death at the result of his preaching being successful. My friends, God is working with his prophet even more than he's working with Nineveh. Praise the Lord that God doesn't give up on people even when their sins are as bad as the Ninevites. But he also doesn't give up on his followers when our thoughts are as sinful as Jonah's. Verse 4. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Notice God is reaching out to this angry hypocrite of a prophet. God doesn't give up. Then in verse 6, God sends some help. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might, shade, might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. God sends a plant over him to cover him up. And this upside-down prophet is happy for the plant that is covering him from the heat of the day, but he's angry over saved lives. Talk about upside-down mission. And then God sends a worm that eats and kills the plant. And look what happens in verse 9. Before verse 9, Jonah gets angry now that the plant is dead. Then God again speaks to him. Verse 9, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? He's more upset about a plant dying than a whole city of humans potentially dying. Sounds insane, doesn't it? For a believer in God to, to think that way, for a prophet of God to feel that way, we walk away, we think, man, this Jonah was a real jerk, right? But be careful. It's true, this guy had a problem caring for others, but let's not be too quick to pick up our stones and to throw them at Jonah. Because, friends, we have to take a good look in the mirror, too. Recently, a study was done by Wes Morris, founder of Evidence America. And his study of church members, not just Adventists, but all church members all over America, he said over 90% of church members have no intention of ever sharing their faith. Whoa. Let's put down our stones for Jonah. And folks, it shows in our country today too. They've done studies on the number of churches, not just Adventists, but churches in general. Here in America, the number of churches here in America that are declining. Anyone want to take a guess how many? 96% of churches in America are declining today. We have forgotten God's call to mission. Are our churches full of Jonah's today? Don't throw too many stones at Jonah. Instead, we need to learn from him. Because, friends, the Bible is consistent. From the old to the new, from Genesis all the way through, This is God's message of grace to save all people. 
The problem is not with the message, amen? The problem is not with the Bible. The problem today is we have too much Jonah in us today, myself included. So what can we learn from God's mission call to Jonah? First thing we learn, God's grace is for everyone. The story ends, chapter 4, verse 11, when God says, should I not take pity on these people who don't even know their right hand from their left? God's grace is for everyone. Second thing we can learn from Jonah is that mission moves us out of our comfort zone. Chapter 1, verse 1, arise and go to Nineveh. It will take you out of your comfort zone. That's not to say that God's going to turn you into a preacher. Maybe preaching isn't your gift. Maybe Bible study isn't your gift. But if God is calling you to mission, you will be uncomfortable when He calls you to do something. But He will gift you to do whatever He calls. Number three, what do we learn from this mission call in Jonah? God does not give up when we make mistakes. Can you say amen? Amen. Jonah chapter 3, verse 1, he again says, Arise and go to Nineveh. He asks a second time. So we can learn that God doesn't give up on us even when we make mistakes. And the fourth thing we learn in this story, friends, there is a price to be paid to follow God's mission. There's a price that we pay. Jonah had to pay that price. But what about us? Are we here at Piedmont Park willing to pay the cost of reaching out to our community? Are we willing to go above and beyond the norm for God's mission to the lost? Or are we content? See, Jonah, he was content being a prophet. He was content to minister in his nice little setting where he was. But God called for more. Are we content with where we are as a church? Are we content with what we've done? What if God calls us for more? What if God tells us to do more, to have a bigger impact in our city, to increase our ministries here so we can increase the lives that we touch? My friends, are we willing to pay the cost for God's call to mission. This afternoon, you heard earlier that several of us are going to be going to the Center for People in Need to help those who are low income, who need to help up. It's about sacrifice. It's about touching lives. Right now, we're in the building campaign to expand our ministries. You see the evidence of it getting started to expand our church and our ministry. But friends, this will not get built without sacrifice. It's not going to fall from the sky. I'd love for it to. I'd love for a whale to spit it out of its mouth and just boom, land here. It doesn't happen like that. God calls us to be a part of mission and to touch another life. Because here's the reality in our world today. We have a world that is desperately needing to hear about God's message of grace. And time is running out for this planet God is calling His people to go to Nineveh. Will we answer? Now, many sermons will tell you what you have to do, but they never tell you how. How do we change the world? How do we answer God's call to wake up a slumbering church? Pastor Michael, how do we do it? It's simple. We have to be like an ant. It's just that simple. Because you see ants in the wintertime, when it gets cold, they get down in the ground and they're all slowed down. They hibernate. They don't move much. That's how they survive. But they can't survive if they don't wake up. And when spring comes and things start to warm a little bit, I heard one pastor telling the story about that ants, well, one of them will get warmed up enough and he'll crawl up and out and he'll get warmed up by the sun. And he'll go back down and he'll get next to another one and he'll warm that buddy up. Then both of those two will go back up and get warmed up. And then those two go back down, and they warm up two others. And then those four go up, and they get warmed up. And then they come back down, and they warm those four up. And exponentially, they warm up the whole kingdom. Folks, 
Christians need to wake up to God's call to mission. Amen? But we will never wake up until we take a second look at God. That first ant, he wakes up only by getting out of his comfort zone, by getting out of the nest and warming up by the sun. We need a second look in the Bible to get warmed up. We need to find God's grace. We need to experience it so much that we can't help but live it and share it with someone else. We need to find God's call to mission. And may that second look that we find in the Bible, may it warm us up and set us on fire so that we can warm another one up too, can warm another slumbering member. And then, folks, like the ants, what do we do? We have to work together. Tiny little ants that can do amazing things because they work together. Everyone doing their part to take the message, the saving message of grace to as many as we can. My friends, a second look was all it took. Years had passed. We'd grown a little older, but we tried it again. And the rock and roll guy and the country music bar fly made it work. We took a second look at each other, and somehow, with God's grace, this time it worked. But our relationship was not the only second look. We took a second look at God, too. We knew that God cared about us personally. We've been taught that growing up. But upon second look, we learned that God cares about other people, too. A second look at Jeanette changed my life forever, for the better, I might add. And a second look at God in our lives changed our lives forever because it called us out of our comfort zone. It called us to sacrifice for others. It called us to share grace and to spread the gospel. But friends, it is. It is a sacrifice. But I'm here to tell you, it is worth every second of it. It's worth everything we can give. It's worth taking a second look to find God's grace and to find His mission. It's worth taking a second look at people who we may think don't want to hear about Jesus in order to realize that they're starving to hear about Him. It's worth every sacrifice we give in order to further God's calling for mission. Let's take a second look. Let's get on fire, and let's go light our world. Will you stand with me as we pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are here today because someone at some point in time heard your call to mission and shared with somebody. Whether it was our great, great, great grandfather whether it was our spouse, whether it was our friends, someone shared you at one point in time, and that's why we're here. And Lord, now you look for us to take our candles, to go warm up someone else, to go share with someone else about your good news of your grace and that you're mighty to save. So Lord, we stand before you today, and we don't want to be the same leaving this place as we were when we came in. So we ask you to touch us, Lord, with your power, to warm us up as we feel that call to share grace, as we feel that call to mission, because there's someone else out there who's dying, dying to hear about you. So, Lord, touch our lives so that we may touch another. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.